Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious word of sovereign grace. Here's this week's message. Count it a great privilege to be here with you at the New Hope Church in Fredericksburg, Texas. First time here. It's not my first time in Texas. <clears throat> I was getting a rental car, whatever day it was now, Thursday, in San Antonio at the airport. And the lady says, is this your first time in San Antonio? And I said, no ma'am, I've been here three times before. All I've had to do with the military. She said, when was the last time you came? I said, it's been 31 years since the last time that I was in San Antonio. Uh, I, I normally don't joke from the stand, but I've got some, just some things I want to talk about just for a minute before I began to try to bring you what's on my heart. Uh, in our part of the country, in eastern Tennessee, it's mountain country, and um, about 150 years ago as the lands to the west began to open up, folks would begin to miss some of their relatives sometimes. You know, they didn't have cell phones. <laughs> and uh, so that eventually they'd send somebody to check on them. <clears throat> and at many of those little mountain cabins, they'd find a piece of wood tacked up on the door. And on that piece of wood would be written, Gone to Texas. You know, so, <laughs> so those folks were looking for something. Uh, they were looking for the wide open spaces and, uh, and so forth. I've, I've, I didn't tack up a, a piece of wood on the door that said, Gone to Texas, but I let everybody know I was coming to Texas. <laughs> Thankful to be here. I, I could have a few uh, last year and a, a few years before that. I, I could have tacked up a door, a sign on my door that said "Going to the Old Baptist," and that would be a better place to go. Not a, nothing against Texas. I'm thankful to be among, counted among a people called Old Baptist. Believe that the Lord's Church is the best place that we could possibly be in. I believe that the truths that are, have been proclaimed from the time of Jesus Christ our Lord on down are those truths and only those truths, brothers and sisters, that will cause the heart to rejoice in the truth of Jesus Christ. And so I ask you this morning uh, to pray for me as the Lord would lead us and bless us. I was blessed greatly last evening. I know some of you weren't here last night. You missed two good messages last night. We've heard one this morning. The Lord is blessed in the preaching of His Word. Aren't you glad for the preaching of God's Word? I hope you are. I don't say that because I'm standing up here. Uh, I came to Texas to hear preaching. <laughs> That's what I came for. Uh, I came to, to be with God's people in a place that I've never seen before, and most of you I've never seen before. But I'll tell you something I've found, and you know this to be the case, that you can go across this country of ours, and you can walk into an old Baptist church, and you're going to feel at home. And the reason you're going to feel at home is because that the Lord's people are there. Not that the Lord's people don't exist in other places, but you're not going to get surprised most of the time. <laughs> maybe, maybe we better say that. Most of the time you're not going to get surprised. And so I'm just thankful that the Lord has blessed us to be in this place. I'm thankful that the Lord has given us His Word. And that His Word is true. And it has been proved. And that uh, you and I can rest in His Word. Now, last evening we heard, as I said, two wonderful messages. And I'm going to, to try to bring... I, I, I thought as I came yesterday afternoon, the preachers know this, you never know whether you're going to get called on or not. And, my dad taught me many years ago, he said, you better have something on your mind. Something on your mind, at least, when you go. Um, so I had something on my mind last night. Uh, but uh, the two brethren that preached, the Lord used that to put something else on my mind. 
And so I pray that, that as we try to bring these thoughts to you this morning, that you, the Lord would bless it to you. I want to talk about how that God has used His Word. He's, as Brother Keith showed us so ably last night, He's preserved His Word. And then Brother Bill Allen came behind him and showed us how that the Lord illuminated the condition of the heart of a man named Nicodemus by his word. His word is, as Brother Keith preached, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. I can't quote. You all are going to see this this morning. I, I came, Brother, Brother Ricky said he was 41 when he was ordained. I was 37 years old when the Lord gave me an experience of grace. And, and uh, I started out behind and it seemed like I've been behind ever since. Uh, but uh, he's been gracious to me. Been very gracious to me. So I can't quote scripture, but I'm going to read a lot of scripture. If you get weary of that, then... Uh, then, uh, then don't. I hope I don't violate any Texas rules. Uh, I know, I'm joking, of course. <laughs> Brother David uh, 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 taught me that uh, uh, we don't do song leading at, uh, in, East, in Tennessee like you all do it here. Usually one or two people will lead to sing. And I, I know that the custom here appears to be that a man gets up and leads two songs. And I think I violated that rule last night, Brother David. I only led one song. I'm sure that that was... <laughs> maybe See, people say, he's not from here. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, Brother Paul writes to Timothy and gives a little background. I'm not going to go over there to Timothy's background. He had a good background. He had a good upbringing. Many of us have had a good upbringing. The Lord has been gracious to us to place us... <laughs> To have us born into homes that were good places to be. Uh, we were taught well. And as Brother Ricky said concerning his preaching, that teaching well did not cause us to be children of God. But I believe it gave us a pretty good foundation upon which to build what God had placed in our hearts concerning that. So Brother Timothy had a good foundation. Uh, he was a young man and so... Uh, uh, Paul writes to him and he, he talks about that and then, then he says in verse 7 of the first chapter of 2 Timothy, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light, through the gospel. Now there's a lot in here. And I can't even touch on most of it. But I want to touch on the last part of this thing. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to, for us to consider. How that God, as Brother Ricky preached this morning. How that God chose a people in Christ. Before the foundation of the world. And Christ Jesus came into, the Lord, uh, into this world. And shed his precious blood to redeem as many as the Lord gave him. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, but my brethren, I'll tell you something. You may not think this way, but it's the way I believe. The Lord could have done all that work that He did before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ could have come into this world, lived, gone to the cross and died, uh, gone to the grave and stayed there for the appointed time and been raised out of that grave. He could have ascended back to the Father on high and no one ever know anything about it in this life. Now I'm saying He could have. I'm thankful he didn't, but he could have. But the blessing to you and me is that as we're born into this world, that we come into the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he brings us to that place where he begins to reveal himself to us.
And that we have a knowledge then. It may not be as we've heard uh, already this morning. It may not be a full knowledge. It may not be a knowledge that uh, has a whole lot of depth to it. Uh, what was the saying? That, you know, the, to know God and to know that you love Him. I'll tell you, when I was 37 years old and the Lord worked a work of grace in my heart, I don't know when I was born again, but I know when that He made Himself apparent to me in my life. And in that doing, I'll tell you something. I grew up as a preacher son. As the old saying goes, I was drugged to church every time the doors opened. But I didn't know anything. But when the Lord worked that work of grace in my heart, brethren, I knew I loved Him. And I knew He loved me. And past that, I didn't know anything. But you know something? I didn't need to know anything else right then. That's all I needed to know. It's all I could stand. I could hardly stand that. Because I, before that, I hadn't known anything about His love. I'd heard it. I'd heard it. I'd seen the evidence of it. I'd seen the blowing in the trees of the wind. But I hadn't felt the wind. I hadn't had that experience come to me personally. But when it did, all oh, the love that was in my heart. And then God began to immerse me in His Word. He didn't just leave me there with feelings. Feelings are good. Oh, I love to feel the Spirit of the Lord. I love to experience the joy of fellowship with the brethren in worshiping God in a good song service and hearing the word preached. I love the feeling of that, don't you? But I'll tell you something, when it becomes based and founded upon the knowledge of what God has revealed to us, now there's a depth to it. And it's not just pure raw feeling, but it's a joyful experience that comes to us in, in feeling these things and knowing what God has done for us. And so, though God purposed these things before the foundation of the world, it is now made manifest. Made manifest by the appearing of our Lord our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Two important things. He brought it to light. How did He do it? Through the gospel. We need never to discount the power and the effect and the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, listen, brethren, I know I'm saying something very obvious, but, but we need to be careful that we don't ever discount that and say, well, you know, the gospel's not necessary. Oh, yes, it is. It's not necessary unto one being born again by the Spirit of God. It's not necessary for that, but it is necessary in the terms of this thing where that we find that God has purposed, and I believe He did purpose, that Jesus Christ our Lord would bring life and immortality to light through the gospel. Well, did the Old Testament saints not have it? Did they have no light? Did they not know anything about immortality? Did they not have the gospel? My Bible tells me that the gospel was preached before unto Abraham. There was a preaching of the God. There was a gospel preached. There was good news that was preached to God's people in all ages. Now listen, it, it, had, it had a little bit of, of surroundings to it. Uh, there, was a, there was some shadows cast around it. There was some, some uh, uh, types and figures that were given uh, to God's people in the Old Testament time. I heard a, a dear brother, I love the Old Testament by the way. I heard a dear brother preach last weekend and I hadn't really heard this before. I'd sort of gotten an undertone of, of that there's some folks that don't think y'all preach too much from the Old Testament. <laughs> he said, he talked about something and brought it up. He said, it just gives you an excuse to preach from the Old Testament. I'm looking for any excuse I can find. And the reason is, not because I want to stay in the Old Testament, not because that I want to, to stay where that there's all kinds of shadows and all you can see is the shadow and you can't see the truth. Brothers and sisters, we looking from the the, the the, the perspective of the New Testament can see the truth in the shadows of the Old Testament. We're not just seeing shadows and types and figures, but we're seeing what God revealed unto them, and I believe that it caused their hearts to rejoice. They had a knowledge of the promise of that one who was to come. 
and who was going to redeem his people from their sins. They had a knowledge of that. I don't know exactly how that operated. I do know that there were some things that they were called on to do that I'm thankful we're not called on to do. Y'all didn't bring a lamb in here this morning. I know that. Yeah, by, the, by the way, I mean a real lamb. You didn't, you're not required. You're not required to worship under the ceremonial laws. You're not required to do those things which had a very strict penalty associated with them if you didn't do it exactly right. I believe there's a good order to be had in the service of God. And I believe He's very lenient with us sometimes. We're not going to die if we don't sing the right songs in the right order and say the right things exactly right. When the, the preacher gets up here and forgets that, uh, and, and uh, as we heard last night, to, um, one scripture that was Brother David brought out was found in the 27th verse of that uh, 34th chapter of Deuteronomy, I believe, where, uh, where that it says that the first time that God wrote by, with the finger of God on the, 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 the Ten Commandments on the stone, but the second time He told Moses, you write... Uh, Brother Keith, I, I, he don't, I don't think he's embarrassed me to say he couldn't remember that. Uh, uh, Brother Ricky this morning, something he couldn't remember. I'm forever, I usually, uh, when I'm in the Old Testament, I'm, I'm getting Moses and Abraham. For some reason, I get them twisted around every time. And I'll, I'll be preaching about Abraham, 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 and I'm talking about Moses. And finally, the good, the good brethren in the church will say, Abraham, Moses, Moses, Moses. Oh yeah, Moses, Moses. You know, but the Lord's not penalizing us for that. He's very strict in the Old Testament. I'll tell you, there's a good order in the New Testament too. That good order is an order of grace and liberty. It's given to God's people that we might profit thereby. And that good order given to us, brothers and sisters, is the order of the preaching of the gospel that causes our hearts to rejoice and causes us to be able to see our blessed Savior as I believe He would have us to see. To see Him in a light of goodness and mercy and grace that's been given to us. I want to give you uh, this morning three examples with the Lord's help of how that the Lord uh, used His Word to illuminate the life of the lives of his people, and I'm going to stay in the Old Testament or the New Testament now, and then how that this life and immortality that's in Christ Jesus was brought to light. If you go with me to the second chapter of the book of Acts, and I find it amazing when I think about it, how that God used his word. He used the word that he had inspired holy men of old to write down in the Old Testament. And when you find the New Testament writings, you find embedded in what we call the New Testament, the Old Testament. Though those brethren spake new things, by, the, by new I mean there was a light and an illumination that was given to them, and they, uh, those things were recorded for our benefit. They, they spake concerning the Scripture, and when they spake concerning the Scripture, it had to be the Old Testament. And so as they brought these uh, new things and the goodness of God in the finished work of Jesus Christ uh, and illuminated those things to the good of His people, they used the Old Testament to do that. On the day of Pentecost, Brother Peter, I love Brother Peter, don't you? Old brash Brother Peter. He's, he's a lot like me. He, he just blunders and says whatever's on his mind. And, and, uh, but you know the Lord used that man. You know that. He blessed him, and he blessed his people greatly through him. And we find here that this great occasion of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on uh, the day of Pentecost, which was a sign of the church of Jesus Christ coming into, I believe, full effect, coming into that, then we find that uh, there was confusion about what was going on, and they actually thought that they were drunk on wine, a new wine. And Brother Peter was the one who stood up and said, No. And no, that's not so. And so I'm going to go, I want to begin reading at, uh, at verse 14 of the second chapter. Uh, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you. Now listen. He said, pay attention now. I'm going to tell you something you need to know. That's not, him, that's not me speaking. That's Brother Peter. Be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. I hope I'm not 
blast anybody out here. I, I speak too loud sometimes. Hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Now listen, he re immediately goes to something they knew about in the Old Testament, and he said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Do you know that there's folks today, good meaning folks I believe, who will argue you to death and say, well I know that's what it says, but it wasn't the last application of what Joel says. They're, they're looking out somewhere in, uh, you know, at, at some new millennium uh, uh, somewhere and they're trying to make, they're saving this. They need this. They're saving it for them because they need it. Then they, they, they can't make it fit here because if they make it fit here, then uh, something, a little, a little uh, piece of a mortar falls out of the, the wall of the, the bricks they built themselves and, and it won't work. But Brother Peter was pretty clear, wasn't he? He said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I don't see how you can mess that up. I don't see how you can. You can't. They do, but I don't see how you can. And then he went on to talk about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the things that were going to happen. I, I'm not, I read a lot of scripture, but I won't read all of it. You go back and read all of it if you haven't read it lately. Now listen. And he comes to verse 21 which is going to be found later on, being quoted again by Brother Paul in the Roman letter. And he says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, brethren, he's not talking about eternal deliverance, but he's talking about the knowledge of eternal deliverance in time. And as he's talking about that knowledge, he's showing them that the Lord has something for them. That they might know these things. And that in knowing these things, that they might be delivered from, as Brother Ricky showed us, this untoward generation. And every generation from that one to this one has been an untoward generation, by the way. We're in a bad one right now. I don't know if it's the worst one yet or not. I hadn't lived in the other ones. This one seems pretty bad to me. And yet, on the other hand... I'm thankful to live in it, aren't you? I'm not regretting living in it. I'll tell you why. The Lord has been so good to me. I want to sing His praise. <laughs> He's been so good. Now, it's a hard time we live in. It seems like an ungodly time that we live in. But brothers and sisters, there's still godliness to be pursued. <laughs> God is still watching over His people. God is still on His throne, ruling and reigning in righteousness. And you and I, though we live in this age, and I, I, is this my one rabbit? I don't know if it is or not. We live in this one age, in this age which we consider to be so terrible. But really and truly, we don't know anything about the persecution that these brethren were about to face. They were about to face some awful things. Terrible persecution. And yet they rejoiced. <laughs> they rejoiced in a lively hope. And in that rejoicing, Brother Peter begins to speak to them concerning the things that have been said to them. And uh, first of all, there's a condemnation. I'll tell you what, if there's not a condemnation in, of sin first in us, then we won't have much to rejoice about when the righteousness of Jesus Christ is revealed to us. There must first be a feeling of condemnation. I, I, I'm, I'm bad about giving my own personal experience, but I said I didn't know when I was born again. I know when I began to feel guilty about the things, and I, I never did feel think I was such a bad fellow, you know. I, I wasn't robbing and, and, uh, and pillaging and plundering and all that stuff. I, I, I was, thought I was a good citizen, and yet the Lord began to reveal to me, I know that this now, I didn't know it then, I didn't know what was going on. I began to feel guilty about the things I was doing and the thoughts I was allowing to go through my brain and so forth. And that went on for a good long while. The Lord used a number of circumstances I won't go into, but He used a number of circumstances to bring me to the place where that finally, finally, I, uh, He brought me to the place of realizing that I was lost and undone and in need of a Savior. Now, now I want to say something. If you were in, ever in that condition again, or yourself, 
You can't come to that condition unless you've already been born again. Your feeling lost and undone and in need of a Savior is a good thing. Because He appears. He begins to make Himself known to you. He begins to reveal the sweet goodness of His mercy and His grace. And as He does that, then though you might have been among the ones who... Ye, he says, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. A man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Listen, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Have you ever heard anybody say, if I'd have been there, I wouldn't have done that? I would have. And, and, and I'm only saying that because I know now, I know my condition. I know. Uh, so, so I'm not going to be so bold as to say I wouldn't have done that. But brothers and sisters, I'll tell you something. When Peter began to preach this to them, he talked of them, began to talk about something they knew something about. They knew the things that David had written, for instance. So he began to talk about something, the things that David had written. And he says this in verse 25, For David speaketh concerning him. David wasn't talking about himself. Though he was in one application, but by the Holy Spirit he was, Brother Peter says, now listen, this is the word of God. David speaketh concerning him. This is New Testament, by the way. This is New Testament. The Old Testament, we just saw what David said. It was recorded. We saw it. It causes our hearts to rejoice. But do you know why it causes your heart to rejoice? I know you do. It causes your heart to rejoice because you know by the Holy Spirit it was speaking of Christ. Amen. Not about David. I, David, uh, you know, I love to read about the history of David. But, uh, but when he's talking about Christ is what I want to see. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Peter stopped quoting right then and says this, Men and brethren, let me freely speak to you. Speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Here's good news. Here's the gospel being preached to these people. And it's the gospel of what God said through David. And it's the gospel where that the preacher, Brother Peter, is going to illuminate this thing by the Holy Spirit that the one standing right in front of him might know what the true application of this thing is. He gave the sense of what David wrote. And, and brethren, that's the only thing a preacher can do. Uh, he, he doesn't have anything of his own to give to you. And if he tries to give it to you, he's in trouble and you're in trouble too. But when he begins to give you what the Lord leads him to, and that is the sense that the Lord has given to him of what has been already spoken what's already been written, then we're on good ground. And so he says, therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that uh, I've already read that. He seeing, verse 31, he seeing this before, listen, spake of the resurrection of Christ. That's good news. That was good news. They, they, most of the ones that were listening to him hadn't gotten there to it yet, but it was good news, and it was it was it was starting to work its way in. Good news will start to work its way in. When you what do you remember the first time that you really heard good news being preached? Do you remember that? Some of some of us some of us may not remember it, but I'll tell you what I remember the last time I heard good news preached too. I, I remember and I love to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ being expounded and and touching upon something that maybe I've read, maybe the Lord has placed a thought on my heart and mind. It, it, have you ever found it amazing that when you come into the house of the Lord? And the preacher begins to preach about something you've had on your mind. Isn't that marvelous how that works? 
God's in that. God's in that to bring these thoughts to our hearts and our minds. He spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. He went on to speak about these things. When he got to the end of this discourse, it says this, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. These same men have been cut in their heart before. And they gnashed on him with their teeth concerning Jesus. I believe it was some of the same men. And now when they heard the revelation of Jesus Christ in the gospel, they were pricked in the heart. Amen. And that means, brothers and sisters, they had a heart that could be pricked, right. could be touched, could be reached. God was doing the reaching and the touching and the pricking. So they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's a good question, isn't it? What shall we do? What shall we do? I say repent and believe the gospel. By the way, that's what Jesus said, too, the first time he began to preach. Repent and believe the gospel. It's good news. God uses his word to illuminate the truths of his word. Now, let's go on to one of my favorite scriptures. Um, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. The Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, you know this. I'm, I'm not bringing any accounts you've never heard of before. The Ethiopian eunuch and Philip are two characters that I love to read about. Philip was a deacon, but he's also called an evangelist. God used him to preach the gospel. I don't know how many times, I don't know what the full application of it was, but I know that with those times that are recorded in his word, and he preached the gospel. And so, there was a man, an Ethi uh, a eunuch of, of Ethiopia, I'm going to begin reading in Acts chapter 8 at verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. There's some keys in God's word that I believe describe people to us. Uh, you know, the folks that don't agree with our, our uh, doctrines, uh, they try to make the poor old Ethiopian eunuch an unsaved man. By that I mean unsaved eternally. Uh, because he hadn't had the gospel preached to him yet. Well, he was unsaved in one way. He hadn't been delivered yet from what he went up to, to Jerusalem to see. He was still going to an old empty shell uh, up there in Jerusalem that had already been, uh, that form of worship had already been taken out of the way. And God had, was, had not yet cast it down completely, but he was about to in terms of the temple worship. Now that's what I'm talking about. He was about to do that. Yet people were still going there. Good, sincere, honest people desiring to worship God. We're still going there. <laughs> and, uh, all right, one more rabbit trail. Have you ever known anybody from another order to come the old Baptist? And all of a sudden it's as though they've heard something they've never heard all their lives. Well, it's the truth. <laughs> they've not heard it. Not, not in that way. Not in the way that it's preached in its simplicity. Not in the form of worship that is so good and sound, I believe, with all my heart. Uh, preaching and singing and praying and some people say shouting and uh, the man that said that said I hadn't heard any of that in a while but anyhow this, it's, a, it's a good and a, and, a, and a simple pattern of worship that's good for the youngest child to the oldest one here it stood the test of time but think about how that, that those who have come and come in sincerity have rejoiced some of us are in here right now aren't we I don't I know the phrase gets used, and I don't, I don't, I'm not disputing this. I was born in the old Baptist church. Well, you were born the old Baptist and carried there and taught. Some of us weren't, by the way. Some people weren't. 
But oh, how good when the Lord begins to bring His people home to the church and begins to show them the pattern that's good for them. So the Ethiopian eunuch was about to get shown the pattern. He'd already been worshiping in the best way he knew how. I believe. So he was returning from that and was sitting in his chair. He must have not gotten satisfied up there because he was still reading. He had a scroll of the book of Isaiah. And he was reading in it, but he was a little confused about it. You know this. Uh, then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Now, now let's stop here for just a minute. Is God not able to reveal in His Word the exact truths of His Word to whoever is reading His Word? I say, I hope you'll hope you'll say, yes, He is able. Yes, He is able. But brethren, if He does not intend the gospel to be preached to some or all, I hope, who have read his word and has the Lord has revealed himself in his word, then why are we here? I believe he intends for his word to be preached. He sent Philip by the Spirit down to preach to this man who was already reading the word of God and there was some light he had in it. And we'll see that in a minute. Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Listen, understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man guide me? That's not taking any of the glory away from God. That's not taking any of the power away from the Spirit's revelation. But brothers and sisters, it is revealing that which we found we started out with. It says, He hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. How can I except some man guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. I love this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his share, so open he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? The spirit had already begun to work and had laid a doubt into his mind that the, that the writing of the Old Testament was not Isaiah speaking of himself. Peter got up and said David was not speaking of himself. He was speaking of Christ and the resurrected Savior. Uh, uh, Philip began right there and showed him that Isaiah was not speaking of himself, but was speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Ethiopian eunuch didn't know anything about him yet, but he was about to. Pretty quick, too. It doesn't take long, does it? I'm talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ being given to God's people. Brothers and sisters, it has been much the same down from generation to generation. I read about the account of an old, my old great, uh, I think it's five great grandfathers back. His name was John Oliver. He fought in the War of 1814 and, and uh, came into uh, eastern Tennessee into a little place called Cage Cove and built a little cabin there. He, the, the, the family history says he was not a very religious man. In other words, he, he didn't mess with that. But his wife began to miss him from time to time. She found him finally one day out in the corner of the cabin where the old chimney was. He was on the far side of that, in that corner, down on his knees, praying. And I'll tell you what, from that point forward, that old man... He, I believe he got up from there and started looking for a place to hear the gospel preached. And there wasn't one, so they just formed a church. They began to, began to have the gospel preached. 
Generation after generation, this same pattern presents itself and begins to repeat itself, not in the exact measurement of every detail, but in the same pattern that God begins to reveal Himself to the heart of the little child of God that's been born of the Spirit of God. And then, brothers and sisters, He sends the preacher, and I, by that I mean that one who has the gospel to proclaim, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. What a blessing that is. Oh, listen, you're the, you're the most blessed people on the face of the earth. You know that? I hope you do. I hope you do. I've just lately come to the old, old Baptist. <laughs> but I'll tell you something. I count myself to be greatly blessed. And I hope you do too. <laughs> I hope you do too. I hope you don't ever take it for granted. What a blessing it is that God has placed you where He's placed you and has led you to this thing. Just like He led uh, those men on the day of Pentecost. Just like He was leading here this Ethiopian eunuch. This Isaiah 53. I told you that it was sweet to me. And again, I'm mixing in personal experience here. 37 years old, sitting on the couch. I had a brand new Bible, my Wife and children had given it to me about two years before that, and the seal hadn't even been broken on it. I'm not proud of this, I'm just telling you. I was having back problems, so I couldn't move around much. And I thought, well, I'll just get that Bible and read it. And I believe the Lord led me to Isaiah 53. And I won't go and read this to you. It's still sweet and precious to me. It was sweet and precious to the Ethiopian eunuch. It ought to be to all of us. I started reading right here. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely, this has got me, this got me. Surely, he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And all of a sudden, that was talking to me. Oh, listen. Oh, what rejoicing already started in my heart. This talking to me. He, he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And I saw that my iniquity was laid on him. And I was free. <laughs> I was free. I was free from the bondage that most of my life I didn't even know I had. I was free from that load of guilt and sin. And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. The gospel was sweet to me. How I love to hear it. I couldn't wait. I called my dad. and I, 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 He was a little skeptical because I'd asked him this before for other reasons. Now, I wasn't among the Old line primitive Baptist. I was among a people called, I wasn't even among them yet, but I grew up among a people called progressive primitive Baptist. And so I called my dad and I said, Daddy, where's, where's one of our churches close by here? And he could have said, Well, you should have already known that. But he didn't. He told me where it was. And I'll tell you what, I could not wait to get there. And I heard the gospel proclaimed. And it, it, was, it wasn't this scripture. But it spoke to my heart what God had already. I'd been reading my Bible a lot before I got there. And now uh, it began to speak to me. And I cried tears of joy to know that what God had shown to me, He was showing to the other people too. That's where we are this morning. I've about gone too long here. But I, I'm thankful. I had some others. I'll, I'll just have to save that. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for the Old Baptist Church. I'm thankful that God has blessed me to be a part of it. I hope I am a part of it. And I pray that the Lord will bless you to realize what good things He hath brought to light through the gospel. May God bless you. Brother David. The Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. 
plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.